hormones are constantly floating through our bloodstream. At any given point in time, you may have growth hormone, thyroid hormone, or luteinizing hormone coursing through your circulation. Some of these hormones, such as the steroid hormones, can pass directly into cells and bind to intracellular receptors. Others, such as protein and peptide hormones, are hydrophilic and must bind to receptors in the plasma membrane of target cells. This brings up an important point. How does the extracellular signal of a hormone get transmitted into the cell? This is commonly accomplished using second messengers, small molecules such as cyclic AMP or calcium. Second messengers relay information from the first messenger, the hormone, into the cell. These second messengers are often produced using common proteins associated with the plasma membrane called G proteins. G proteins are coupled to receptors in the plasma membrane of the cell. G protein coupled receptors can mediate the responses to signals such as hormones and neurotransmitters. Many different types of ligands can activate G proteins such as fatty acids, proteins, peptides, or amino acids. Interestingly, about half of all known drugs work through G protein coupled receptors. Let's take a closer look at how G protein signaling mechanisms work. Hormones floating through the bloodstream may circulate freely or may be complex with binding proteins. In the bloodstream, the hormone dissociates from any associated binding proteins and moves out of the capillary and into the interstitial fluid. The hormone then binds to a hormone receptor in the plasma membrane of a target cell. The hormone receptor is associated with the G protein, as shown here, which is attached to the cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane. The G protein is responsible for relaying the hormonal information to downstream signaling pathways within the cell. They can be coupled to enzymes or ion channels in the plasma membrane. Each type of G protein is specific for one of these signaling pathways. G proteins have three subunits, an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. When the G protein is in an inactive state, the alpha subunit has a bound guanosine diphosphate, or GDP. The binding of the hormone to the G protein coupled receptor initiates a conformational change in the G protein. This stimulates the alpha subunit of the G protein to exchange its bound GDP for GTP. With this GTP bound, the G protein is in an active state. The activated G protein dissociates into the alpha subunit and a beta gamma complex. The actual target of the activated subunits depends on the G protein that is activated. In this video, we will first examine the pathway in which cyclic AMP serves as a second messenger. The G protein in this case is a stimulatory protein called GS. The activated alpha subunit of GS binds to the enzyme adenylyl cyclase. This enzyme converts ATP, adenosine triphosphate, into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP can serve directly as a signaling molecule, or it can act indirectly through activation of proteins within the cell. For example, four cyclic AMP molecules can bind to the regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, or PKA. This allows the catalytic subunits of PKA to dissociate, and PKA can then phosphorylate intracellular targets. The response of a cell to cyclic AMP and PKA activity depends on the cell itself. A wide variety of hormones utilize cyclic AMP and G protein signaling, such as ACTH, glucagon, LH, PTH, and TSH. For example, the hormone glucagon can travel through the bloodstream to the liver and bind to G protein coupled receptors. This initiates an increase in cyclic AMP which leads to the breakdown of glycogen in the liver. Since many hormones and neurotransmitters rely on the cyclic AMP signaling pathway, the response of a cell will depend on the cell type itself. An increase of cyclic AMP in a liver cell will cause a very different response than an increase in cyclic AMP in a renal cell 
or in an adipocyte. For proper cell function, the cell must also be able to stop the G protein signaling pathway after it has accomplished its task. To terminate this signal, the cyclic AMP must be broken down using the enzyme cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase. The catalytic subunits of PKA then reassociate with the regulatory subunits. In order for the G protein to become inactivated, the alpha subunit must hydrolyze its bound GTP back into GDP using its GTPase activity. The alpha subunit then reassociates with the beta gamma complex, and the G protein is once again back in an inactive state. The cell is then ready to be stimulated by another hormone. G proteins can also initiate another common signaling pathway that utilizes intracellular calcium as a second messenger. Once again, the hormone dissociates from many complex binding proteins and moves out of the capillary and into the interstitial fluid. The hormone then binds to a G protein coupled hormone receptor in the plasma membrane of the target cell. The G protein in this signaling pathway is called GQ. The alpha subunit of the G protein exchanges its bound GDP for GTP. And the activated alpha subunit dissociates from the rest of the G protein. In this particular pathway, the alpha subunit activates phospholipase C, or PLC. This enzyme acts on the molecule phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, also called PIP2. Phospholipase C cleaves PIP2 into two molecules, inositol 1,4,5-triphosphate, or IP3, and diacylglycerol, DAG. IP3 is a small water-soluble molecule that is released into the cytosol and travels to the endoplasmic reticulum. As you have seen in previous lectures, the endoplasmic reticulum stores a large amount of calcium in the lumen. IP3 binds to a ligand-gated calcium release channel in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and calcium flows into the cytosol. At the same time that IP3 is initiating calcium release, DAG is migrating through the plasma membrane to activate protein kinase C, or PKC. The C in PKC is named because calcium is necessary for full activity of this kinase. The calcium released from the ER by IP3 assists in full activation of PKC. Once activated, PKC phosphorylates a number of intracellular targets, thus transmitting the initial message of the hormone binding to the hormone receptor. In order to terminate this signal, calcium is resequestered in the endoplasmic reticulum. And PIP2 is reformed. The alpha subunit of the G protein hydrolyzes its bound GTP into GDP, and the G protein reassociates. This restores the resting state of the cell so that another hormone can initiate cellular effects. Today we have looked at two of the major mechanisms by which G proteins operate within a cell. This is one of the major ways in which hydrophilic hormones are able to exert intracellular effects. Please review this video as many times as needed to familiarize yourself with the G protein signaling pathways.